slumber's chains hath bound me. In a year that will hardly be remembered for any hectic pace or significance that could be attached to movement itself, yet we abjure in matters of the soul and spirit as we recall a famous journey, and movements too of the body that might be described as of an inner and outer character. Thus immobilised but not defeated, today we come together to celebrate Bloom's Day. In doing so, we are honouring that great work of 20th century literature, James Joyce's Ulysses, a work that on publication startled and changed the world of literature. I am delighted to have the opportunity of hosting what must be this year a virtual event here for Morris and Uchtroin, and may I sincerely thank all those who are enabling us to share this special day together, in particular our performers, Claire Barrett, Lisa Lamb, Simon Morgan and Nolo Grady, as well as our musicians Eamon de Barra, John McLaughlin and Vincent Lynch. Bloomsday 2020 is special too, as we remember Stephen Joyce, James Joyce's grandson, his last remaining direct descendant, who died in January 2020 at the age of 87, thus severing Ireland's direct family link. Stephen was the subject of James Joyce's beautiful poem, Eke Poor, and was a scrupulous and sometimes formidable custodian of the James Joyce literary estate. In a manner that often brought Joycean scholars and enthusiasts, indeed, to the point of frustration. He and I had known each other for some years, but had correspondent and exchanged telephone conversations most recently in regard to his decision to accept Irish citizenship, of which he was very proud. Before my visit to James Joyce's grave in Zurich in 2018, I had a discussion with Stephen on one final project that he wishes to have undertaken, which involved having James Joyce's poem, A Flower Given to My Daughter, Frail the White Rose and Frail, Are Her Hands That Gave, Whose Soul Is Seer and Paler Than Time's Worn Wave, Rose Frail and Fair, Yet Frailest, A Wonder Wild, In Gentle Eyes Thou Veilest, My Blue Veined Child. Stephen wanted this inscribed on the Joyce family grave in Flunthern. In this way, by use of the space perhaps held for him, Stephen hoped in some small way to honour James Joyce's wish to have his daughter Lucia, who is buried in England, brought together with him and Nora in their final resting place. Discussions are underway and it is my hope that the final wish can be fulfilled. Stephen wished his own ashes to be with those of his beloved Solange, who died in 2016. While the 16th of June is an important date on the Dublin literary calendar, dedicated to marking the anniversary of Leopold Bloom's legendary walk through Dublin in the summer of 1904, inter alia carrying a bar of Sweeney's lemon soap required for his bath and excitation of the senses, as we celebrate the genius of one of Ireland's greatest ever writers, today is surely also a most appropriate day for acknowledging creativity in all its forms. Let us celebrate and give thanks for the many great creative talents with which we as a nation have been gifted. They are talents offered to us on which we so often draw to navigate us through difficult moments or aspects of our lives in the work of those who work in the fields of culture and the arts. Now among the livelihoods threatened by the measures to respond to COVID-19 are their lives and livelihoods. They have sought our solidarity and our support, and we should give it unstintingly. As a nation and as a global community, we are undertaking together a most difficult but shared journey as we respond and get beyond COVID-19. It is a journey that challenges us to draw on our reserves of resilience and solidarity. It is a journey that has brought tragedy to so many families and much hardship 
to so many of our citizens. These last few months have been a time of reflection and an opportunity for those who wish to take it to reevaluate what it is that we choose to value and indeed what together we might do better and how we could be spurred on from here to the construction of a society that can better address our shared existence, our shared vulnerability and our interdependence. Of one thing we can be certain, as to visions of the future, it will, as it has always been, the emancipatory, freedom-giving, loving and best-fulfilling version of the future, having been anticipated already and suggested by artists. A life without the contribution of artists, of limited public opportunities for sharing cultural experiences, of being lifted to transcendence by performance in the many forms of the arts, would be quite a miserable encounter with life. In times of crisis and isolation, it is the arts which so often bring us reassurance, contribute to our well-being, and allow us, as a means of collective expression, a crucial vehicle for citizen participation. Without access to the space of culture and the arts, one is not experiencing the fullness of citizenship. It is greatly ironic, therefore, and not a little frustrating, even rightly infuriating, how in times of crisis, it is so often the arts and the cultural sphere that are among the greatest victims, not appreciated for the importance of what they do, and even sometimes dismissed as a luxury that cannot be afforded, or as an added extra that does not merit consideration or priority in times of economic difficulty. Of course, it is precisely when failures of the economy are being endured that one wants not to be further excluded, beyond income loss, by being excluded from participation in the cultural space. We know that the current COVID-19 crisis has had devastating consequences for cultural practitioners across the globe. In Ireland, we've seen the cancellation of over 12,000 cultural events to date, leading to losses in excess of 10 million euro within the industry. Those are bleak figures, and let us not forget the individual hardship, endangered potential, insecure futures, and lost opportunities for the many artists for whom those figures are a lived and stark reality. Never defeated each year on this date, the 16th of June, we honour, we'll always honour, and celebrate that novel Ulysses, its author and subject that it is regarded as one of the most distinguished examples of the narrative technique known as stream of consciousness was a point made in early good Joycean studies. But Joyce's wish was that his book would come to be enjoyed by all and a shared, very Irish, very Dublin source of the humour that was involved in the contradictions by which we live our lives. As we are brought Deeply on June the 16th into the thoughts, reflections and recalled memories of Leopold Bloom, we are invited to interpret as well as to be entertained, to be an active participator in the process of engaging with the book. This has been a tough spring. For some, as I have said, tragic. For others, in being forced to endure distancing from loved ones as they depart at this life, alienating even. But it also showed another part of Ireland's heart in the generous commitment to work on behalf of us all and the reaching out of communities, groups and individuals, which was superb. Among those to suffer loss of livelihoods with all its consequences were cultural workers. In March, as the lights went down on our theatres, as libraries, museums and galleries shut their doors, as readings were cancelled, Concerts postponed, arts festivals suspended. The cultural space began to fade from our view in our cities, towns and villages. Some venues, events, productions are in danger of disappearing entirely from the public world if we do not prioritise their retrieval, making culture safe, central, with all its liberating potential, enriching vision and its history 
at its best, its purpose of courageous challenging of the status quo. The cultural sphere is a constant work in progress, one which relies on our engagement, our involvement and our contribution if it is to survive and thrive. If we do not access that space, support it, participate in it and ensure that it is not assigned a peripheral space on the edge of society, we are in danger of becoming passive players in its demise. Allow me to repeat it all over Europe as well as here. Today we are facing an emergency in the cultural sphere in terms of income, venues, public access, participation, social cohesion and quality of our daily lives. It is a time that urges us to recall and reflect on the vital role of creative people in any truly functioning or cohesive society and the need to support artists whose work is so important for the structure of that society and as the best guarantee of the imaginative possibilities of all of our people in the future. Traditionally, on Bloom's Day, some of you gather with friends and families to replicate Leopold Bloom's legendary walk through Dublin on that summer's day in 1904. Such an excursion, for both the eclectic and the merely curious of you, is something that may not be possible this year, for even if you have the greatest anticipation of being well, well soaked, or are acknowledged as the most experienced social distancer, and are willing to swear off close dancing, you cannot do it as you did before. Yet let us resolve that our virtual journey this year will not be a passive one, but one in which we will all play our active part in the crafting of that shared future where our cultural world with all its potential for social good is not left struggling for survival in the wake of COVID-19. We have historically so often neglected that cultural world and in the process we've neglected our great artists and writers, failing to acknowledge their necessary and immeasurable contribution to our society. As well as being one of this country's most famous literary figures, James Joyce is also one of our most famous exiles, struggling to produce work in a society not shaped to accommodate his creative vision. He left this country and became a man apart, a perennial outsider. As we rebuild our society and our economy in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must make sure we see the pandemic as the aberration that it is. There are warm aspects of our culture to which we will return, which we will not give up. There are aspects of our COVID-19 existence which we all, in the interests of all, must support. But it is meaningless and defeatist to call it the new normal. There will be, when the virus is gone, forms of collective joy again, and for all generations. We must ensure that we are constructing an Ireland inclusively shaped to accommodate all forms of artistic expression, rejecting any narrow concept of the arts, or as any residual to be tolerated but confined to the fringes of society, their value reduced to narrow utilitarian terms. As to tomorrows, it was James Joyce himself who once said, I am tomorrow or some future day, what I establish today. All generations must come and be involved in establishing a new tomorrow, in recrafting the cultural space, recognising that resourcing the arts are part of the fundamentals of the structure of our society, just as our, are our roads and hospitals and schools as they seek to serve a public purpose. Marfocal Square. We should never forget either those who for so long and over the years held the fort, such as Deirdre O'Connell, whose birthday we have always celebrated here at the Oris, and others too who continued the task. Our Deirdre O'Connell would surely be pleased with a fabulous work on Lucia by another Deirdre, Deirdre Mulrooney, which you may have heard in Santa Miscellany. Today, as we recall and celebrate, Joyce's renowned reimagining of the ancient myth of Ulysses, his vision in bringing into being 
a myth upon a myth, exciting and mould-breaking. It should remind us that we too have an opportunity to revisit, remake, build upon and reimagine myths. To do that, let us all resolve to let nothing allow the arts and all their diversity be ever allowed to die or be made further frail. Happy Bloomsday to you all. Keep washing your hands, even if it is without Sweeney's soap. Verbanacht. A Uchtron, Sabina, happy Bloomsday. It is a great privilege to be here at Oris on Uchtron. Uh, we're going to sing one of Joyce's favourite songs. It is a song that he himself sang many times and a song that he gifted the sheet music to his newly found love, Nora Barnacle. This is Down by the Sally Gardens. <laughs> Down by the Sally Gardens My love and I did meet She passed the Sally Gardens With little snow white feet she bid me to take life easy as the leaves flow on the tree. But I was young and foolish with her. The following reading is from the chapter known as Cyclops, from James Joyce's Ulysses. I picked it because it reminded me in these times with so many different people in our New Ireland that love is the most important thing. It's 5pm on June 16th in 1904 
and we find Bloom and a few gents in Barry McKiernan's pub in Dublin city centre. Will you try another one, citizen? Says Joe. Yes, sir. Says he, I will. You? Says Joe. Beholden to you, Joe, says I. May your shadow never grow less. Repeat the dose, says Joe. Bloom was talking and talking with John Wise and he quite excited with his dunduckety mud-coloured mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. Persecution, says Bloom. All the history of the world is full of it. Perpetuate national hatred among nations. But do you know what a nation means, says John Wise. A nation? says Bloom. A nation is the same people living in the same place. By God then, says Ned, laughing. If that's so, then I'm a nation, for I'm living in the same place for the last five years. So, of course, everyone had to laugh at Bloom. And says he, trying to muck out of it, are also people living in different places. That covers my case, says Joe. What is your nation, if I may ask? says the citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here, Ireland. The citizen says nothing. When he cleared the spit out of his gullet and gob, he spat a red bank oyster out of him right in the corner. After you with the push, Joe, says he, taking out his handkerchief to swab himself dry. Here you are, citizen, says Joe. Take this in your right hand. Shove us over the drink, says Zoe. Which is which? That's mine, says Joe, as the devil says to the dead policeman. And I belong to a race too, says Bloom. That is hated and persecuted also now, this very moment, this very instant. God, he near burnt his fingers with the butt of the cigar. Robbed, said he. Plundered, insulted persecuted, taking what belongs to us by right at this very moment, says he, putting his fist in the air, sold by auction, off in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem, says the citizen? I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says John Wise, stand up to it then with force like men. That's an almanac picture for you. Mark, a soft-nosed bullet. Old lardy-faced Bloom standing up to the business end of a gun. God, he'd adorn a sweeping brush so he would if he only had an horse's apron on him and then he collapses all of a sudden, twisting round all the opposite as limp as a wet rag. But it's no use, says Bloom. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not a life for men and women. Insult and hatred... And everybody knows that's the very opposite of that that is really life. What? Says Alf. Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. I must go now, says he to John Wise. Just round to the court a moment to see if Martin is there. If he comes, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. Who's hindering you? And off he pops like grease lightning. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal love. Well, says John Wise, isn't that what we're told? Love thy neighbours. That chap, says the citizen. Beggar my neighbour is his motto. Love my ya. He's a nice pattern of a Romeo and a Juliet. I know where he's gone, says Lenehan, cracking his fingers. Who, says I? Bloom, says he. The courthouse is a blind. He had a few bob on throwaway and he's gone to gather in the shekels. Is it that white-eyed kaffir, says the citizen, that never backed a horse in anger in his life? That's where he's gone, says Lenin. I met Bantam Lyons going to back that horse, only I put him off it and he told me Bloom gave him the tip. Bet what you like, that's where he had. Bet what you like, he has a hundred shillings to five on. A dark horse. He's a bloody dark horse himself, says Joe.
The castle car drove up with Martin on it and Jack Power with him and a fella named Crofter or Corfton. So in comes Martin asking, where's Bloom? Where is he? says Lennon. Defrauding widows and orphans. St. Patrick had want to land again at Ballykinla and convert us, says the citizen, after allowing things like that to contaminate our shores. Well, says Martin, rapping for his glass. God bless all here is my prayer. Amen, says the citizen. And I'm sure he will, says Joe. Right, says Ned, taking up his John Jameson and butter for fish. I was looking around to see who the happy thought would strike when damned but in bloom comes again and letting on to be in a hell of a hurry. I was just round at the courthouse to see looking for you. I hope I'm not. No, says Martin. We're ready. Courthouse, me I, And your pockets hanging down with gold and silver. Mean bloody scut. Stand us a drink itself, devil a sweet fear. There's a Jew for you. All for number one cute as a shithouse rat. Hundred to five. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, says the citizen. Beg your pardon, says Bloom. Come on, boys, says Martin, seeing it was looking blue. Come along now. Don't tell anyone, says the citizen, letting a ball out of him. It's a secret. And the bloody dog woke up with a growl. Bye bye all, says Martin, and he got them out as quick as he could. Jack Power and Croft and or whatever you call him, and Bloom in the middle of them, letting up to be all at sea with them up on the bloody jaunt and car. Off with you, says Martin to the Jarvey. But be gob, I was just lowering the heel of the point when I saw the citizen getting up to waddle to the door puffing and blowing with the dropsy and he coursing the course of Cromwell on him, bell, book and candle in Irish, spitting and spatting out of him and Joe and little Alf around him like a leprechaun trying to peaceify him. Let me alone, says he. And because he got as far as the door and they holding him and he bawls out of him, three cheers for Rizariel. Ara, sit down on the parliamentary side of your arse for Christ's sake and don't be making a public exhibition of yourself. Jesus, there's always some bloody clown or other kicking up a bloody mortar about bloody nothing. Cup, is it torn the porter sour in your guts so I would? And all the ragamuffins and sluts of the nation around the door and Martin telling the driver to drive ahead and the citizen ball and an Alf and Joe at him to wish and he and his high horse about the Jews and the loafers calling for a speech and Jack Power trying to get Bloom to sit down on the car and hold his bloody jaw and a loafer with a patch over his eye starts singing If the man in the moon was a Jew, Jew, Jew and a slut shouts out of her Eh, hey, mister, your fly is open, mister! And says he, Bloom, Mendelssohn was a Jew, and Karl Marx, and Mercadante, and Spinoza, and the Saviour was a Jew, and his father was a Jew, your God. He had no father, said Martin. That'll do now. Drive ahead. Who's God, says Citizen. Well, his uncle was a Jew, says Bloom. Your God was a Jew. Christ was a Jew like me. God, but the Citizen made a plunge back into the shop. By Jesus, says he, I'll brain that bloody Jew man for using the holy name. By Jesus, I'll crucify him as I will. Give us that biscuit box here. Stop, stop, says Joe. Gob, the devil wouldn't stop him till he got hold of the bloody tin anyhow. And out with him, a little elf hanging on to his elbow and he's shouting like a stuck pig. As good as any bloody play you'd see in the Queen's Royal Theatre. Where is he till I murder him? And Ned and JG paralysed with the laughing. Bloody war, says I, I'll be in for the last gospel. But as luck would have it, the Jarvey got the nag's head round the other way and off with them. Hold on, citizen, says Joe. Stop. Begob, he drew his hand and made a swipe and let fly. Mercy a God, the sun was in his eyes. Or he'd have left Bloom for dead. Cop, he near sent it into County Longford. The bloody nag took fright and the old mongrel after the car like bloody hell and all the populace shouting and laughing and the old tin box clattering along the street. You never saw the like of it in all your barn puff. God, if he got that lottery ticket on the side of his pole, he'd remember the gold cup. He would so. 
I'll pick up the citizen would have been lagged for assault and battery and Joe for aiding and abetting. The Jarvey saved his life by furious driving as sure as God made Moses. What? Oh, Jesus, he did. And there's a volley of oaths after him. Did I kill him, says he, or what? And he's shouting to the bloody dog, after him, Gary, after him, boy. And the last we saw was the bloody car round in the corner and old sheep face on it, gesticulating. And the bloody mongrel after, with his lugs back for all he was bloody well wore to tear him limb from limb. Hundred to five. Jesus, he took the value of it out of him, I promise you. When lo, there came about them all a great brightness. And they beheld the chariot wherein he stood ascend to heaven. And they beheld him in the chariot, clothed upon in the glory of the brightness, having raiment as of the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible that for all oh, they dost not look upon him. And there came a voice out of heave. Elijah! Elijah! And he answered with a main cry, Abba Adoni! And they beheld him, even him, Ben Bloom Elijah, amid a cloud of angels, ascending to the glory of the brightness. At a 45 degree angle over Donahue's on Little Green Street like a shot off a shovel. What an honour to be here at Oris Nuktoran for Bloomsday 2020. And this next piece is one of the Moore's melodies. They're ever present in Joyce's work and um, indeed are an example of how Irish culture has gone around the world and influenced everyone from Beethoven to Nina Simone. This next piece indeed inspired Bugs Bunny. It is Believe Me If All Those Endearing Young Charms. And here is Vinnie. Believe me if all those endearing young charms Which I gaze on so fondly today were to fade by tomorrow and fleet in my arms like fairy gifts faded away thou would still be adored as this moment thou art let thy loveliness fade as it will and around the dear ruin Each dream of my heart Would entwine itself verdantly still While beauty and youth are thine own And thy cheek unprofaned by a tear That the fervor and faith of a soul can be known To which time will but make thee more dear Know the heart that has truly loved never forgets, but as truly loves on to a close, as the sunflower turns on her God when he sets, the same look which she turned when he
the life of James Joyce, and by extension his works, have betrayal and doubt in their recurring themes. None truer than in Ulysses, whose episode Sirens has 158 allusions to 47 songs. James Joyce, according to contemporaries, sang heart achingly, and this enabled him to place beautifully songs to best convey emotion in his masterful short stories and stories. It is June the 16th, Thursday, 1904. Leopold Bloom is in the Ormond Hotel in the Keys in Dublin, listening to songs such as The Crappy Boy, Tutto e Sholto, Love's Old Sweet Song, Mappery, Home Sweet Home, The Last Rose of Summer. And as he listens, he's aware that his wife Molly and Blazes Boylan, Molly's singing partner and agent, are about to meet at the Joyce home at 7 Eccles Street, ostensibly to make plans for their forthcoming concert on the following Monday in Belfast. Bloom is also aware that his wife and Blazes Boylan are not just going to make plans that afternoon. The last rose of the summer is emblematic of Bloom's isolation, triggered by this impending betrayal at around four o'clock. Thomas Moore wrote The Last Rose of Summer in 1805, and it was arranged by his Dubliner friend, John Stevenson, from a traditional Irish air. John Stevenson was from Crane Lane in De Temple Bar. The Last Rose of Summer has a hauntingly beautiful melody and it's no surprise that Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Floto, and Joyce himself have used the works of this beautiful song. I think Brian Friel puts it very well when he says, music can be intravenous emotion. For Leopold Bloom that day, music was indeed intravenous emotion. Music can make you feel under the sandwich bell lay on a beer of bread one last, one lonely, last sardine of summer. Bloom alone. Tis the last rose of summer left blooming alone. All her lovely companions are faded and gone. No flower of her kindred no rosebud is nigh to reflect back her blushes or give sigh for sigh. I'll not leave thee, the lone one, to pine on the stem. Since the lovely are sleeping, Go sleep thou with them. Thus kindly I scatter thy leaves o'er the bar. 
Where thy mates of the garden lie soundless under dead. So soon may I follow when friendships decay and from love shining circle the gems drop away when true hearts lie withered and fond ones are flown. Oh, what inhabit this bleak world alone oh what inhabit this bleak world alone Well, on this very special Bloomsday, uh, there is no more apt song than this one, speaking of empty halls and laughter having fled. And hopefully we will be back to full halls very soon. But in the meantime, this piece that features in James Joyce's uh, portrait of, of an artist as a young man, where Stephen yearns for home, and this, this particular piece wants him to be back in that Ireland and forget about emigration and to be... Um, with his friends once more in those joyful, bustling party halls that we will hopefully have soon back again. This is Oft in the Stilly Night. Oft in the stilly night a slumber's chain hath bound me fond memory brings the light of other days around me the smiles the tears of boyhood's years the words of love then spoke the eyes that shone now dimmed and gone the cheerful hearts now broken thus in the stilly night her slumber's chains hath bound me sad memory of other days around me. When I remember all the friends so linked together, I've seen around me fall like leaves in I feel like one who treads alone some banquet hall deserted, whose lights are fled, whose garlands dead, and all but he departed. Thus in the stilly 
Her slumber's chain hath bound me. Sad memory brings the light of other 